Greetings, everyone. This is Al Fadi. Welcome back to a continuation of this fascinating video series on uh, Sharia law, the Islamic Talmud. And uh, starting with today's episode, at least, we're going to take a slight shift, uh, myself and our dear brother Lloyd DeYoung, and we're going to start talking about the historical aspects and development of Sharia law. With me, of course, as I stated, is our dear brother Lloyd DeYoung joining us virtually. Lloyd, as always, thank you so much for your work and for uh, taking the time to be here. Now, today, oh, you. Uh, you are going to venture into uh, a new aspect or a new angle of Sharia law, and I'm, I'm really interested uh, uh, for people to, to learn about uh, what you're going to share with them. And of course, uh, you did allude to the fact that there might be some overlap with the work that we've been doing with Dr. J. Smith in terms of the historical criticism of Islam in general. Yeah, yeah. certainly. Hey. I believe so. Yes, there will be overlap. Very good. Take it away, my brother. All right. So thank you. So let's look at, let's go back to the Umayyads and the Abbasids, where this started and continually developed. So the Sharia took about 900 years to develop. It was not something that happened overnight. Now, there were two late Meccan converts, Abu Sufyan and Abbas. They were progenitors of the two great Arab houses to rule Islam as an empire. Abu Sufyan of the Umayyads, which was a period that lasted 661 to 750 in Damascus, and Abbas of the Abbasids, 750 to 1258 in Baghdad. Neither of those exactly in the heart of Arabia, Mecca. Now, we have no preserved Umayyad historians, which is very interesting. So within Islam, one sees constantly that historical records disappear. And somehow one is left with a very fuzzy notion and just these narratives which cannot be proven true because there's simply a lack of records. This happens a lot. So the figure of Abu Sufyan lies largely unredeemed in the debris of early Islamic history. Now, many historians who wrote under the Abbasids did their best to rehabilitate the memory of Abbas. So now we've got this propaganda. So you cannot separate the Sharia from the culture. And one has to understand there's a propagandistic aspect of power struggles as well. And Muslim tradition has Muhammad marrying Umm Habiba, Abu Sufyan's daughter in 628, and Maimuna, Abbas's sister-in-law the following year. Now, one can say, is this true? Or is this simply a way to give them some level of authority, to give them some kind of, um, what's the word, legitimacy? Right. That's a question that one can ask. So I know he remembers my great, great, great grandmother also. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How does one know? Exactly. So now the prophetic period ran from 610 to 632. The Quran is revealed over 23 years. Okay. Muhammad is born around the year of the elephant right here. Here's where he dies, and this is where Uthman supposedly finalizes the Quran, right? Around 656. The Quran is transcribed onto bones, rocks, sheep intestines, well, and no mistakes were made, none. All of the Hadith and the Sunnah occur here, but they're not recorded. The foundations of the Sharia and the Fiqh are now established. The Fiqh is the jurisprudence, the Sharia is the law, the verbatim speech of Allah and Muhammad, and the jurisprudence, the exegesis of that. Now, there's no more need for ijtihad, independent legal. There's no need for ijtihad during Mo's lifetime because the law came directly from him. No one had to interpret this afterwards. Right, afterwards, they had, sorry, there had to be interpretation. But during Mo's lifetime, he simply gave the law because he was the law giver. Meccan surahs tend to show a pseudo-Judeo-Christian religious influence on the Quran. So Meccan surahs have a very strong sort of Judeo-Christian religious influence. But the Medinan surahs show a legal influence. Now, it's interesting that Medina had eight to 10,000 Jews. And they, of course, were steeped in their halakha. They had the Talmud. So there's clearly some kind of overlap here where they borrowed from this Jewish legal tradition. So Arabs had customary law. However, the Jews had a written legal system recorded in the Talmud, Talmud in Hebrew and Aramaic. And as we know, we're finding more and more sources in Aramaic linked to the Quran, but showing borrowings into the Quran. Both of these groups, though, spoke Arabic. Quran 1094. So if you are in doubt about that, which we have revealed, ask those who have been reading the scripture before you. Well, so the Jews had a detailed corpus of theocratic law, and the Quran instructs that they need to check with those who read the scripture before. The usul is the roots, right? Usul al-fiqh is a metaphor for a tree, but the tree of life is the Torah. This is a very strong Jewish symbol. So this idea, the roots of the law, this is borrowed from the Jewish um, concept of life. And the Quran, there's a Jewish word called kara'ah, 
to proclaim, to read aloud. This is what Jews do when they were proclaiming the Torah in the synagogue. Now, the Jewish scripture is also called the Mitra, and the Christians had the Karyana. This was also the Aramaic word for the reading, the lessons. So the word Quran, Karyana, Karana. So this seems to derive from a Christian source. Yes, Alfadi? Yeah, I was going to say it's, it has roots like Aramaic or Syriac roots here, Kriyana. Yeah. Yes. Right. Now, of course, notice that it says here within, if you look inside the Talmud, they have also the Kriyana. But you, I am a Kara. So I am someone who proclaims. I'm someone who reads the Torah. He reads the Pentateuch. He reads the prophets, prophets and the hagiographer with exactitude. So this concept of someone who speaks the Kara, the Quran, Right, this idea is already embedded. You can see within the Jewish thinking, the Jewish way. I should also note this is a map. This is Kariyat Al Fal Kariya. Right, this is Najran. Here is Mecca. This is Yemen, and you have the Kariya as a Quranic term. Also indicates an important town: Mecca, Medina, Sodom. Interesting, Sodom and Gomorrah, Nineveh, and the coastal town are so called Kariya, and Al Kariyat Ain is a Quranic term for Mecca and Medina, but also. Al-Qaratayn is also a term for Jerusalem and I believe Hebron, which is very interesting. The same term applies to Jerusalem and Hebron. And Qariyat al-Fal, right, the same word as Qariyat, if there, there seems to be some kind of link there, is the capital of the first Kinda kingdom. These were Yemeni pagans who worshipped the moon god Sin, who invaded that area and controlled it. So just something to keep in mind in terms yeah. of similar words. With and, and, now, and Mecca is called yes. Um Al Qura. Um Al Qura. Mecca is called Um Al Qura, the mother of all villages or towns. Interesting. So yeah, this this term goes back to both pagan sources as well as Jewish sources. So it's clearly not originally, shall we say, an Arabic idea. Now the Aramaic speaking Christians called their scriptures the Kiriana, which is really a, very similar to the word Quran. So it's an Arabic Quran. And the term Quran is morphologically closer to Karana than to Mikra. So this may suggest a Christian influence on Muhammad. And the recitation of the Quran in the mosque is called Kira'a, the precise equivalent of the Hebrew Keria, public Torah reading, which again argues now for a Jewish influence. So maybe you have a Jewish messianic influence. And in coining the term Quran, Muhammad used the Hebrew Aramaic terminology. Kara is not a native root in South Semitic Arabic, but was borrowed. So I just want to make that point. And the emphasis on an Arabic Quran is an attempt at legitimacy. And this information comes from Islamic and Talmudic jurisprudence, The Four Roots by Judith Romney Wagner. It's a very interesting paper. And I mentioned that in the very first episode, we discussed that. Moses also speaks of someone who has to speak. So Moses said to him, let the one who reads the letter be the agent to fulfill its contents. Now, in the cave of Hira, Muhammad is told, now, depending on the account, he's told to read. And he's told to recite. Now, Moses recited. Now, I'm not sure what, Mo, what Muhammad recited if he didn't know the Quran, but somehow he recited. But it also says that the reader of the letter be the messenger who delivers it. So Muhammad had to read. Now, did Muhammad steal this idea? Did, did Islam steal this idea that the reader of the letter is the messenger who delivers it? Muhammad's the messenger. And in the cave, he had to read or recite. You have Karan, Karan, Karyan. Right, which within the Hebrew context is reader or proclaimer. Mm -hmm. And one who makes a proclamation, let the one who makes the proclamation be the one who delivers it. Muhammad made proclamations. He was the messenger. And also, Quran also means calling or reading. So now you've got reading, proclaimer, calling. These ideas were pre-existent before Muhammad. So he maybe was presenting himself as the fulfillment of this Jewish idea. I will leave that here. And I'll move forward to the Rashidun period, 632 to 661. The Quran is finalized as a written text under Uthman, supposedly. The Hadith and the Sunnah remained oral traditions. The Quran, Hadith, and Sunnah are understood to have a purpose. Well, maybe not. At the time, they were simply really just seemed, they seemed to be more like folk stories without any particular legal meaning or legal emphasis. This comes later, as we will discover. And then You've got the very beginnings of the Sharia, the Fiqh, and the Ijtihad. So the personal reasoning and interpretation of the Rashidun hold authority. As we saw in the previous episode, the early scholars, those seven scholars, hold great authority. So we don't yet have 
a written corpus, but you've got this idea that has been part of the culture. And the Rashid means orthodox or rightly guided. So these are the first four caliphs and the Khalifa as a title after the first four caliphs, right? So this passes to the Umayyads. They are, so they create this idea of Khalifa. But notice there is orthodoxy in Islam. The Rashidun means there is orthodoxy, and Muslims like to argue about that, but actually there is a consistency and an orthodoxy. And I'll pause here, Thal Fadi. Very good. Uh, excellent way of uh, expositing this historical background. And I think people uh, can start to see uh, some issues. And I mean, I like what you said, like uh, when it comes to the Umayyad, uh, there isn't a whole lot uh, that you can learn about uh, their founder, but somehow uh, you have some preserved parts of the history about the Abbasides, but yet that can lead you to, to really start to wonder about that political tension that was taking place between the two and how one would like to suppress the other. And we know that the Quran probably was became a masterpiece and was formalized in a lot of aspects of Sirah, and also hadith, uh, uh, you know, the, these are the formative years of that in the written form under the Abbasid. So it seemed like all the pieces are starting to fall into place when it comes to the uh, uh, Islamic, uh, you know, standard Islamic narrative as opposed to factual findings right now. now you know, what are we going to cover next time? So we'll go to the Umayyads and we'll talk more about how the Quran developed, sorry, not the Quran, the Sharia developed and the tensions between these groups. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much. And thank you everyone for joining us. Until next time, have a blessed day. Thank you for watching this video. Be sure to like and subscribe to our channel, Sira International, and click on the bell so that you receive notifications whenever we publish a new video or go live. I would also like to appeal to you to consider becoming a Patreon patron by clicking the link right below. By doing so, you can give towards the production of these videos. There are also other options for you where you can give to our channel. I thank you from the bottom of my heart.